Good day grade 12s. My name is Viola from the Distinction Bound Student and I'd like to welcome you to Lesson 95 from the Distinction Bound Student Textbook written by Cardin Madzokir. Today's lesson is a possible essay and the good news is that Cardin made us a mnemonic that will help us remember. In Lesson 94 we introduced the topic so we come in with background information. As usual, we start off by revising homework activity 83 given in the previous lesson. Question 1. What is the difference between procyclical and acyclical indicators? For Marx, procyclical indicators move in the same direction as the general economy, they increase when the economy is doing well, decrease when the economy is doing badly. GDP is an example of a procyclical indicator. Acyclical indicators have little or no correlation to the business cycle, they may rise or fall when the general economy is doing well, and may rise or fall when it is not doing well. That's it for our homework. Let's dive into the lesson of the day. Today's lesson is in Unit 2 and it's about economic indicators. There are six key economic indicators. Cardin came up with the following mnemonic for economic indicators and it goes as follows. People pay money for every purchase. The P in people stands for production indicators. The P in pay stands for price change indicators. The M in money stands for monetary change indicators. The F in for stands for foreign trade indicators. The E in every stands for employment indicators. The P in purchase stands for productivity indicators. So in the exam this mnemonic will definitely help you come up with these indicators. Let's kick start with production indicators. Under production indicators we will look at real GDP or GDP at constant prices, nominal GDP or GDP at current prices and lastly per capita real GDP. What is real GDP or GDP at constant prices? GDP at current prices is a measure of a country's economic output based on the current market prices of goods and services in the year being measured. It reflects the total value of all final goods and services produced within the country's borders, and each product's value is measured at the prices prevailing during the specific year of calculation. Example, let's consider an imaginary country called Econland. In the year 2022, Econland produced 100,000 smartphones, and each smartphone was sold for 5,000 rands. The GDP at current prices for 2022 would be calculated as follows. GDP at current prices, 2022, equals number of smartphones produced, 100,000, times price per smartphone, 5,000, equals 500 million rands. GDP at constant prices, also known as real GDP is a measure that adjusts for the impact of inflation or deflation by using a fixed or base year's prices. This method allows for a more accurate comparison of economic output across different years because it eliminates the influence of changing price levels. Example, let's continue with our example of Econland. To calculate GDP at constant prices, we use a base year, such as 2020, to set fixed prices for goods and services. In this scenario, the base year is 2020 and we know that each smartphone was sold for 4,000 rands in 2020. Now, in 2022, we use the 2020 prices to calculate the real GDP. GDP at constant prices, 2022, equals number of smartphones produced, 100,000, times price per smartphone in the base year, 4,000 rands, equals 400 million rands. So the key difference between GDP at current prices and GDP at constant prices lies in how they handle changes in price levels. GDP at current prices reflects the economic output using current market prices, which means it includes the impact of inflation or deflation. In contrast, GDP at constant prices adjusts for inflation by using fixed prices from a chosen base year, allowing for a more accurate comparison of economic performance over time. GDP at current prices provides the nominal value of a country's economic output, including the impact of changing prices while GDP at constant prices accounts for inflation or deflation by using a base year's fixed prices, providing a more meaningful comparison of economic growth over different time periods. Per capita real GDP, also known as real GDP per capita, is a measure that indicates the average economic output, gross domestic product, per person in a country, adjusted for inflation or changes in price levels. It is calculated by dividing the real GDP of a country by its population. The formula for calculating per capita real GDP is as follows. Per capita real GDP is equal to real GDP divided by population. Real GDP is calculated using the GDP at constant prices, 
which accounts for inflation by using a base year's fixed prices, as explained in the previous response. Example. Let's use an imaginary country called Atterbury as an example to calculate its per capita real GDP. Year 2020. Real GDP of Atterbury in 2020, at constant prices, equals 500 billion rands. Population of Atterbury in 2020 is equal to 100 million. Per capita real GDP is equal to 500 billion rands, real GDP, divided by 100 million, population, equals 5,000 rands. In this example, Atterbury's per capita real GDP in the year 2020 is 5,000 rands. This means that, on average, each person in Atterbury contributed 5,000 rands to the country's economic output after accounting for inflation using constant prices from the base year. Per capita real GDP is a useful metric for comparing the standard of living and economic well-being of different countries or for tracking changes in a country's economic performance over time. It helps economists and policymakers understand how the economic benefits generated by the country's production are distributed among its population. Higher per capita real GDP generally indicates higher income levels and a higher standard of living for the people of a country. Look at the difference between South Africa's per capita real GDP and the one for the United States of America. You can clearly see that these figures indicate that USA is a developed country and South Africa is a developing country. Standards of living in South Africa are low. We will look at current figures shortly. Also look at South Africa's real GDP and per capita GDP percentage change on this table before we jump on to current figures. What do the percentages in this graph indicate? Let us know in the comments section down below. Let's have a look at this statistical release for GDP from Stats SA which was published on June 6, 2023. Remember in the previous lesson I showed you the site from where you can access any economic and social indicator. If you look at this contents page, you will realize that this whole document is dedicated to real GDP and not nominal GDP. Why am I saying so? Because everywhere it says constant prices and not even a single table shows current prices. Now let us have a look at this table. So we have GDP contributions from each and every industry in our economy shown here. Instead of showing you, let me rather ask questions. That way you might be able to understand better. Question 1. Which year is currently used by the Reserve Bank as a base year? Question 2. What is the value of South Africa's GDP for 2022? Question 3. Identify a year when our economy experienced a negative growth rate. What could be a possible reason for that? Question 4. Which economic sector contributed the most to GDP in 2019? Pause the video and answer the questions I asked. That way you can get the most out of this lesson. I believe you have written down your answers. Let's do a quick revision. Question 1. The year used by the Reserve Bank as their current base year is 2015. How do we know? Look at the heading of this table. You will see that it says constant 2015 prices. Question 2. South Africa's GDP for 2022 is 4.6 trillion rands. In full it's 4,599,261,000,000 rands. In the exam, you can just copy that last figure from the table, put the R symbol for rands and an M at the end for million. Many of you have written 4,599,261 rands. You think the South African economy is smaller than the value of one house in Menlin? If you don't put that R and M, we will mark you wrong. It's there in the table, you can see it but you decide to ignore it. Then you have to pay the price by losing marks because you cannot be that ignorant. Question 3. Our economy experienced a negative growth rate in 2020 and it was due to the lockdown that was caused by COVID-19. Question 4. The economic sector that contributed the most in 2019 is finance, real estate and business services. Which by the way is a very good thing. Can someone tell me why I'm saying so? Let us now have a look at the percentages. I'm 100% sure that you know how to calculate these percentages. If you want to calculate the growth rate for 2022, you say GDP for 2022 minus GDP for 2021, then the answer divided by GDP for 2021 multiplied by 100. That's easy right? So according to this table, we can confirm that our answer for which year had a negative growth rate was correct because we said 2020 and look here, GDP growth rate for 2020 was negative 6%. Extremely bad. 2021 had the highest growth rate of 4.7%. That's good recovery. Take note however, that even though 2021 recorded the highest growth rate, 
GDP for the year 2021 is lower than 2016, 2018, and 2019. COVID took us back to producing less than what we produced four years prior. This can make you understand business cycles as well. Let's get back to other economic indicators. Before we look at other economic indicators, let me talk about the table that I asked you to have a look at. The blue bar represents economic growth and the red bars represents economic development. Why do I say so? Because GDP measures growth and per capita GDP measures development. So from the graph, we can clearly see that our economy grows more than it develops. Also you can see that economic development had a negative growth rate in 1998 and 2009 while economic growth only had a negative growth rate in 2009. The South African economy experienced higher growth and development rates from 2004 to 2007. Let's now look at other economic indicators. Out of the six, we have only covered one. Price change indicators are responsible for inflation. Inflation is defined as a sustained increase in the general price level and a decrease in the purchasing power of money. Under price change indicators, we will look at CPI and PPI. Consumer Price Index, CPI, is the official index used in inflation targeting. CPI show price changes of a representative basket of goods and services that consumers buy. The index covers metropolitan and other urban areas. It is an overall index and the weights are obtained from the expenditures of different income categories of households. It is the most comprehensive indicator measuring consumer inflation in South Africa. It shows changes in the general purchasing power of the RAND. Interest rates are the main monetary instrument used by SARB to fight inflation. As of June 20, 23, CPI was at 5.4% year-on-year. Funny enough, in the textbook it was 5.4% in 2017 and currently it is 5.4%. What a coincidence. Anyways, that 5.4% year-on-year means that prices of goods and services in general have gone up at a rate of 5.4% since June 20, 22. Let's have a close look at this table. The Reserve Bank targets inflation for South Africa within a 3-6% to band. When inflation is above 6%, the Reserve Bank will take necessary measures to bring it down. A 1.4% rate recorded in 2004 is not a bad thing at all. It even sound unrealistic. That's a too-good-to-be-true type of scenario. The worst inflation rate between 1996 and 2013 was recorded in 2008. It wouldn't surprise us that much since there was a global crisis anyway. Let's move on to PPI. Producer Price Index, PPI. PPI measures the cost of production rather than the cost of living or consumption. Basket consists of goods only. Capital and intermediate goods are included. Prices exclude value-added tax, VAT. Interest rates are excluded. Prices of imported goods are shown explicitly. As of June 20, 23, PPI was at 7.3% year-on-year. This is a bit too high and it might cause CPI to go beyond the 6% target. In comparison, CPI measures the average change in consumer prices from the perspective of urban households, while PPI tracks the average change in producer prices from the perspective of businesses involved in the production process. Both indices are crucial for understanding inflation dynamics and their impact on different segments of the economy. Let us move on to the third category of economic indicators which is monetary change indicators under which we will look at money supply, repo rate, and prime rate. Let's start with money supply. The money supply is controlled by SARB and it is classified into three categories namely M1, M2, and M3. The money supply is the responsibility of the SARB. It is important to give early warning of likely changes in inflation. The SARB defines the quantity of money to consist of three aggregates. M1. Includes coins and notes and demand deposits for the domestic private sector with monetary institutions. M1 June 2015, 1,315,412, which is 9.44% increase over one year. M2 is equal to M1 plus all other short-term and medium-term deposits of the domestic private sector with monetary institutions. M2 June 2015, 2,305,254, which is 8, 9% increase over one year. M3 is equal to M2 plus all long-term deposits of the domestic private sector with monetary institutions. M3 June 2015, 2,867,036, which is 8, 89% increase over one year. Next up is the repo rate. 
This is the interest rate charged by the central bank, SARB, to commercial banks and it serves as the benchmark for the other interest rates in the economy. As of July 23, 2023, the repo rate was at 3.5% per annum. Remember I said a patient needs a doctor when some figures indicate that they are sick. I also said in the previous lesson that the Reserve Bank is like a hospital for our economy and the governor is like a doctor. I also mentioned in that video that the drip that carries medicine for our sick economy can be the repo rate. I've linked the video I'm referring to down below. Let's now see how effective the repo rate is to curb inflation. Let's look at this graph. I don't like this one, let me go to the one on page 221 which will make my explanation clearer. CPI is represented by the red line and repo rate is represented by the blue line. In 2001, inflation began to increase. Look at how the Reserve Bank responded to that. They increased the repo rate. Inflation continued rising and the central bank also continued increasing the repo rate. Remember I mentioned earlier that the current repo rate is 3.5%. Look at the repo rate at that time. It was as high as almost 14% and it was all because inflation was high. You only take medication when you are sick. Likewise, the economy needs high interest rates when inflation is high. Due to the high repo rate, what happened to inflation? You can clearly see that it started to decline and when the Reserve Bank saw that they had successfully dealt with the problem, they also reduced the repo rate because there was no need for it to stay high. Keeping it high for no reason would be poor management of the economy. Allow me to proceed. Let's conclude monetary change indicators with prime rate. Prime interest rate or prime rate or prime lending rate. This is the interest rate charged by commercial banks when it lends money to other banks or individuals. The prime rate is always higher than the repo rate so that commercial banks can be able to recover, pay back, the repo rate. As of July 23, 2023, the prime lending rate was at 7.5%. Just out of curiosity, are you aware that Cardin rubs shoulders with the governor? Seems like you don't believe me. Let me show you now you believe. Next up is foreign trade indicators. Under foreign trade indicators we have terms of trade and exchange rate. International trade is important for the purposes of globalization. The terms of trade is the ratio of export price to import price. Changes in the terms of trade may be followed by a change in the balance of payments. The exchange rate. The exchange rate is the price of one currency in terms of another currency. If the exchange rate changes, this will influence the price of imports and exports. Importers and exporters therefore monitor the exchange rates of the currencies of the countries with which they trade. Next is employment indicators. Under employment indicators we will look at full employment, economically active population, unemployment rate and lastly employment rate. Full employment. Full employment refers to aim of providing everyone who is willing to work at current wage rate with a job. Increase employment to decrease loss of production, produce more goods and services. Economically active population, EAP. Unemployment is calculated by expressing number of people who are willing and able to work, but do not have a job, as a percentage of the total number of people that are willing and able to work, EAP. EAP, people between 15 and 60 or 65. Unemployment. The proportion of EAP that are actively looking for work but are not working. Unemployment is currently, as of July 23, 2023, at 32.9%. Employment rate. Employment rate is the proportion of the economically active population, EAP, that are working. It is calculated by expressing the number of employed people as a percentage of the EAP slash labor force participation rate. Employment is important for the forecasting of trends. SA employment rate was plus or minus 75% in 2005, low compared to rates in developed and some developing countries. Growth in the economy is not accompanied by similar growth in employment numbers. Employment indicators are used for three purposes. To calculate trends in employment in different sectors or industries, to disclose structural changes in economy, to calculate productivity, to show success of economy in utilizing its full potential, and increasing demand for highly skilled labor while there is an oversupply of low-skilled labor. Average wage increases that are higher than the inflation rate. The strong presence and influence of trade unions in the economy. Labor unrest, strikes and work stoppages which cause a loss in number of days work. Restructuring of the economy and introduction of new international competitiveness of domestic producers, which has led to layoffs of low-skilled workers. 
Finally we get to the last indicator which is productivity indicators. Productivity is an average measure of the efficiency of production. It can be expressed as a ratio of output to inputs used in the production process, i.e. output per unit of input. When all outputs and inputs are included in the productivity measure it is called total productivity. Labor productivity measures the amount of goods and services produced by one hour of labor. More specifically, labor productivity measures the amount of real GDP produced by an hour of labor. Growing labor productivity depends on three main factors, investment and saving in physical capital, new technology and human capital. As usual we conclude with homework activity 84 on page 205. Question 1. Briefly discuss the uses of per capita figures. 8 marks. That's it for today. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. Also hit the notification bell for you to get notified every time we post new content to our channel. We are also giving away the Distinction Bound student t-shirts to people who buy more than 10 books. At the moment we have the following textbooks, Economics Grade 10, 11 and 12 plus Business Studies Grades 11 and 12. We are looking forward to adding more books to our catalog. Remember our books come in two versions, Complete and No Answers versions. Complete versions have answers and No Answers versions do not. Thank you so much for your support. See you in the next video. God bless.